couple of decades ago, maybe 20 or 30 years ago, India was suffering from communicable diseases. We had lots of cholera, typhoid, poliomyelitis, things like that. But as the, as the economy progressed, as we socially progressed, the communicable diseases are slowly disappearing. And instead, we have non-communicable diseases, which are basically atherosclerotic cardiovascular diseases and malignancies. Now, among these cardiovascular diseases, the most important factor which produces this cardiovascular disease is possibly hypertension or increased blood pressure. The problem with increased blood pressure is that many people do not know, only half the people who are hypertensive know that they have increased blood pressure. And among this, only half gets treated. And among those half who get treated, only half actually reaches the recommended levels. So it is a pathetic situation as far as blood pressure is concerned. Moreover, blood pressure, as you know, is a silent killer, which means it does not produce any symptoms. The patient who has a high blood pressure will not know he has a high blood pressure unless he checks his blood pressure. So the first message they be, that we have to give you is that you check your blood pressure at least once in a year, whether you are hypertensive or not hypertensive. And the increase in blood pressure or the hypertension is increasing in prevalence in India because number one of the food that we eat, which contains a lot of salt, which contains a lot of sugar, which contains a lot of saturated fat, and the lack of exercise, which results in obesity, which is another factor which produces increased blood pressure. So maybe the best way to tackle this epidemic of non-cardiovascular diseases, this epidemic of cardiovascular diseases is by uh, treating blood pressure by identifying increased blood pressure and treating high blood pressure. So to discuss on this aspect now, we have a good panel here. I am the moderator. I am Dr. Govindanumni from Thrissur. We have four eminent panelists with me, Dr. Pancholia from Indore, Dr. Vijay Kumar from Secunderabad, Dr. Chauhan from Bareilly, and Dr. Vipul Gupta from New Delhi. So we'll start the discussion. Let me first ask Dr. Pancholia to tell us what exactly is hypertension? What exactly is blood pressure? Because you know, usually people say blood pressure is 140 over 90. So what is this 140? What is this 90? And which is important? Please elaborate on these things, Dr. Pancholia, please. Uh, the lateral pressure which is created by the flowing of the blood in the arteries in the, on its arterial wall is called blood pressure which is normally there and essential also for the flowing of the blood in the arteries. But when it exceeds the normal, then it is called high blood pressure or hypertension. There are two levels. One is the upper level, which is called systolic blood pressure, which is mainly because of the contract during the contraction of the heart, while the lower level is called diastolic blood pressure, which is during the relaxation of the heart. The normal upper level is around 120 to 130 millimeter of mercury, and lower level normal is 80 millimeter of mercury. More important is the upper level that is systolic blood pressure because it is directly correlated with the risk of heart attack and the stroke. Thank you very much, Dr. Pancholia. So when the heart contracts, we get the systolic blood pressure. And when the heart relaxes, we get the diastolic blood pressure. Both are important, but we know that systolic blood pressure is probably little more important than the diastolic blood pressure. OK, now let us come to the second point, that is heart attack. We are talking about heart disease and and to hypertension. So let me ask Dr. Chauhan, please tell us what is heart attack? Again, from a, from a point of view of a layman, please explain in simple terms what is heart attack? Well, the heart is behaving just like a reservoir which is distributing the blood to the entire body. And just like a cashier who has a lot of money but doesn't take it his own salary unless until the salary note is made. So similarly, the blood does not uh, the heart does not take the blood directly from the heart which it has. It has uh, three vessels which are called as coronary arteries are supplying the blood to the heart. Once they get clogged, once they get blocked, then there is a pain in the chest or maybe there is a sudden death. So this is called as heart attack and uh, this is a very serious problem which can take in place which is preventable. One of the big important problems with heart attack, as you very rightly said, is that the first manifestation of heart attack may be death. So treatment, the patient may not get the treatment. So what you require in this situation is prevention. And one of the major ways how you can prevent heart attack is by controlling the blood pressure. So let me ask Dr. Vijay Kumar, tell me how hypertension or increased blood pressure affects the heart. The relentless blood flow from the left side of the heart, the left ventricle, puts pressure on the arteries. And as the blood pressure increases, it puts much more pressure on the arteries. Normally, the arteries are very 
uh, elastic and pulsatile, so it co accommodates a lot of blood flow from the left ventricle. And also the vascular endothelium, that is the inner lining, is very smooth and allows a lot of blood flow to the uh, other organs to receive their oxygen and nutrients. But in blood, as the blood pressure increases, the pressure on the arteries increase and the, these arteries become more thickened and, and not amenable to uh, accommodate more blood. At the same time, this pressure can also breach the vascular endothelium. Once the breach occurs, the fats that are circulating in the blood can deposit there and form what is called as an atheroma. This in turn reduces the volume and the circumference of the blood vessel, decreases the blood flow. And not only does it decrease the circumference, this also creates a milieu where a clot can form and can suddenly stop the blood supply to that organ. If it stops the blood supply to the heart, it's called as coronary artery disease. The other problem is the left ventricle has to work harder if the blood pressure goes on increasing. That uh, creates a situation where the left ventricle has to increase its activity, which it does so by increasing its muscle mass. Once the muscle mass is increased, that's called as left ventricular hypertrophy, which is an independent risk factor for coronary artery disease. The other problem is continuous pressure on the arteries. At certain vulnerable points, the arteries uh, give way and create some areas where they are very fragile and form small sacs like thing called as aneurysms, which can burst and create a life-threatening situation. So, so increased blood pressure affects the heart in several ways. It will increase the oxygen need for the heart because the heart has, has a more work to do. But at the same time, it will reduce the supply because as you rightly said, the vessels are damaged and atherosclerotic plaques form. So there are a lot of ways how an uncontrolled blood pressure will affect the heart. There are several factors which produce heart attack and as you have more and more risk factors, the risk also goes up. One beautiful study which was done on this aspect was the inter-heart study which looked at the causes of heart attack across the world. Uh, let me request Dr. Vipul Gupta to tell us about this study and what are the risk factors which produce heart attack. So this is a very important study in the present context what we are discussing. This study was carried out in 1999 to 2003 across 52 countries where around 30,000 patients were taken and around nine risk factors were studies. The risk factors which were mainly studies were age, sex, race, diabetes, smoking, exercise, intake of fruits and vegetables, hypertension, dyslipidemia and obesity. And it was found in those studies, if we control the risk factors early at the age, then the chances of patients having cardiovascular disease was much less. If the patient has more number of risk factors, the chances of his having cardiovascular disease was much more. And amongst those nine risk factors, the major risk factors which were found to be more prevalent and effective in controlling were hypertension, diabetes, obesity, as well as the smoking. And if these risk factors were controlled, then the patient will have lesser chances of further cardiovascular events and mortality and morbidity. And we should focus today now controlling in lifestyle modification more than the disease control in a later age. And emphasis should be passing on the message to control these risk factors. Thank you very much, Dr. Vipul Gupta. So again, let me ask Dr. Pancholia to tell us what is heart failure? Heart failure is the inability of the heart to pump enough blood to fulfill the requirement of the body. It may be acute when it develops suddenly, particularly when there is sudden acceleration of the blood pressure takes place or when there is acute heart attack or when there is sudden rupture of the wall of the heart, so you get acute heart failure. While the chronic heart failure it is slowly progressing in rheumatic heart disease or valvular heart disease or congenital heart disease or when there is a disease of the muscle of the heart, what is called cardiomyopathy. It may also be uh, a systolic heart failure and diastolic heart failure. Systolic heart failure de develops when the, when, the, when, the, when the heart is unable to pump with enough force, while the diastolic heart failure, when the, the inability to fill the, uh, the proper blood in the, in the heart, so unable to pump out. So the systolic and the diastolic heart failure. And both heart failures are the, are the serious condition and that requires a proper medical care. So heart failure, as the name itself implies, means the heart is failing to do its function, which is pumping blood to various organs of the body. Now, as you rightly said, there are several causes of heart failure. I think you enumerated quite a large number of causes of heart failure. But like heart attack, it is also a multifactorial disease. And one of the most important factors is, again, a rise in blood pressure. This was actually shown by another interesting study published called the SPRINT trial 
the relationship between hypertension and heart failure and how the incidence of heart failure can be drastically reduced by reducing the blood pressure to very low levels. May I request Dr. Chauhan to enlighten us on this printed trial? Uh, the relationship of uh, hypertension and heart failure is very intense. It has been observed that about patients of heart failure, 80% uh, of them, they are having the hypertension earlier than they get the heart failure. So therefore, their relationship is very complex and very straight. See, what exactly happened, you discussed about the, you talked about the SPRINT trial. The SPRINT trial is one of the landmark trial which shows that when you reduce the systolic blood pressure and bring down to 120 or so. In this particular study, they have found that if you uh, reduce the systolic blood pressure, say around 120 or so, then you find that the uh, chances of failure becomes very low. Especially acute decompensated heart failure is about 36% reduced, which is substantial. Therefore, if you can control the blood, systolic blood pressure adequately, you will be able to take care of this dreaded complication. So that is one point that we learned from sprint trial because earlier it was said if you are 70, you can have a blood pressure of 100 plus 70, that 170 is fine. But with sprint trial now we know that irrespective of age, yes. whether you are 70 or 80, you have to bring down the blood pressure to it as low as possible. It has been made very clear in a senior sprint trial. Correct, this correct. Same kind of yeah. So your age doesn't matter. Your blood pressure has to come down and that will prevent not only heart attack but also heart failure. On this note, let's take a short break and we'll be back very soon. Healthcare partner. Welcome back. So we were discussing about the relationship between high blood pressure and the heart diseases. So we will continue now. The third problem with heart as far as increased blood pressure is concerned is that after some time, the heart starts beating irregularly, what is known as atrial fibrillation, and that also has a lot of complications. So let me ask Dr. Vijay Kumar to tell us what is atrial fibrillation and how hypertension affects As you that. As rightly said, hypertension, hypertension is one of the major risk factors for atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation means an irregular fast heart rate. This is created by abnormal electrical impulses that are generated in the atria, and that causes sudden vigorous uh, contractions in the atria. Because atrial fibrillation increases the heart rate, it increases the cardiac workload also. Because the atrial fibrillation also causes the ineffective blood uh, pumping into the ventricles, there's pooling of blood in the left atrium, especially near the left atrial appendage, and it can cause the formation of clots. These clots can get dislodged and get deposited elsewhere, like in the brain most commonly, and can cause a stroke. And moreover, that continuous beating of uh, the atria and conveyance to the ventricle causes the ventricle to weaken, and ultimately, they can lead to a situation called as heart failure. That is ineffective pumping from the left ventricle to supply the needs of the body. The other problem, atrial fibrillation per se can also simulate coronary artery syndrome. So, so we have discussed three ways how uncontrolled blood pressure affects the heart. One is heart attack, second is heart failure, and the third is the abnormality in the regularity of the heart contraction or atrial fibrillation. Now, you know, medicine is an abstract science, unlike physics or chemistry. In medicine, 2 plus 2 is not always 4. It is somewhere near 4. It can be 3.8 or 4.2 also. So there can be difference of opinion as to, to what level the blood pressure should come down, in which group of people. Moreover, the situation in US or uh, England where the where the most of the money is funded by the insurance companies is different from India where we had to pay out of the pockets. And that is why to, con to, to co go over this difference of opinion, we have guidelines from America, 
from Europe and even from India, we have Association of Physicians in India guidelines. So let me ask Dr. Vipul Gupta, please tell us what are these guidelines, especially with regard to hypertension. When should you treat a patient? When should you leave a patient alone, etc.? So as you rightly said, the dictum of 100 plus age is no more longer is taken as a blood pressure control level. There are different guidelines which are prevalent in America and India as well. The commonest guidelines which are given by the AHA ACC take the 120 systolic and 80 millimeter of mercury diastolic as a normal level. But if the levels are between 120 to 129 and 80 to 89, they are taken as elevated levels and they should be treated in patients who are high risk. High risk means those who have a already history of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or a renal disease or a stroke. But in patients who are asymptomatic, the levels of above 130-90 should be taken as a basic level and should be treated. The more important is rather than knowing the levels is to see and monitor the levels at home. I, I would suggest that home monitoring of blood pressure is very important in this context because sometimes we come across white coat hypertension where the patient comes to your clinic, is found to be having a blood pressure very high, 150-100, but he goes home and takes blood pressure, he says I, my blood pressure is normal. But then to exclude this, the home monitoring of blood pressure is very important and to check the blood pressure regularly and follow the doctor and take the medication regularly is more important rather than the guidelines. Moreover, when the, when the, I think when you take a home blood pressure monitoring, you have to tell the patient that when you get a headache or a giddiness yeah. and you check the BP, the blood pressure it's will be high. high. That is not hypertension. Not that high. is only a, a reaction to your yes. headache or your uh, giddiness. If you take actually many people in that situation take an extra tablet of their antihypertensive yes. medication, which is dangerous because it will drop the blood pressure and in fact may cause a stroke. So home blood pressure monitoring is now being more and more advised because when you take the blood pressure in the office in presence of a doctor, many times you may have an apparently high level. So from there, from hypertension and heart disease, now let us come to diet because it is now widely discussed across social media, across lay public, across all sorts of media, the importance of diet in controlling not only hypertension, but also heart disease and diabetes for that matter. Dr. Chauhan, please explain. What is that? See, this is a very good issue and one of the very, very important thing because let me make it very clear that uh, the serum cholesterol and diet cholesterol are different. Serum cholesterol is not necessarily to be high because if it is high, this will get deposited around the um, uh, arteries and arteries will get blocked. But uh, serum cholesterol uh, is important. But diet cholesterol is not necessarily to be on the uh, very higher side. See, there was a time when we used to say that you take about 100 milligrams to 300 milligrams of cholesterol in the diet per day. But what exactly happened that, that if you increase your uh, uh, diet cholesterol, like uh, eggs, eggs are one of them which is a rich source of diabetes with the cholesterol, then possibly this is not going to have. Even now the American government says that you can go for about seven uh, eggs a day. But you should be very, very careful not to increase the saturated fats, not to trans fats, not to increase the bacon, the red meat and the, the sausages, the desi ghee, the makkhan, the butter, and so on and so on, which, which can be harmful to that. But the diabetic people should be careful. And all those people who are high risk, they should be little careful about. Thank you, Dr. Chauhan, for really elaborating on that point. I think the DGCA guidelines has created a lot of confusion. People are confusing dietary cholesterol with serum cholesterol. When the DGCA said dietary cholesterol is not important, people believed that serum cholesterol is also not important. That is not correct. Serum cholesterol is important. Well, there are other things in the diet also and lifestyle modification. We will, I will ask Dr. Vijay Kumar to tell us about lifestyle modification other than maybe the cholesterol improbably other than that. You rightly said, sir, for any disease, non-communicable lifestyle modification is an important aspect. And as regards hypertension, it may prevent the development of hypertension or definitely will delay the onset of hypertension and even if the hypertension is there, probably we will be using lesser drugs so that uh, the side effects are not there. The one of the most important factors in lifestyle modification is one is obesity or overweight. The overweight people, the heart requires to pump more blood to supply adequate nutrients so heart works more. So if you lose at least one kg of your weight, then it decreases at, at least one millimeter of uh, blood pressure. 
So if you lose 10 kgs, you will lose about 10 millimeters of mercury. That is a very good thing. The other thing is uh, exercise. Physical inactivity increases your heart rate. Any exercise at least for 150 minutes per week like walking, jogging, cycling or swimming will definitely help in the reduction of blood pressure. At least most of the studies have shown that at least 6 millimeters of systolic blood pressure is reduced by 150 minutes of exercise. And the third and the most important is the dietary approach to stop hypertension. And this has been widely uh, done through, for the last two decades. It only indicates that you, if you eat more fruits, more vegetables, more legumes, low dairy products and a bit of poultry, fish and eggs is okay. But you should avoid saturated and transaturated fats like Sir has already said, especially the red meat, bacon, ghee and other things. This will help in definitely the reduction. The other important aspect of diet is sodium, sodium or salt. So salt consumption, most of the bodies that are deal with uh, this have suggested that less than 5 grams of salt is good enough to prevent the onset of hypertension. And in, uh, in certain situations like heart failure, probably even less than 3 grams of salt is indicated so that the heart will be able to function better and it will also prevent the onset of hypertension. The other aspect which is important is to avoid smoking. Smoking indirectly and directly causes major harm to the arteries and causes and raises hypertension. Alcohol is also uh, a risk factor for hypertension, but at a, if you have to drink, a moderation in alcohol drink is important. Two ounces of whiskey in a male and one ounce in a female is an accepted level of alcohol, but beyond that it causes a problem. And these, the, along with these, the, the uh, control of your stress factors, adequate sleep and other things are also important as they go a long way in reducing the hypertension. Thank you, Dr. Vijay Kumar. Uh, last but one question is regarding statins. As you know, the cholesterol lowering drugs, whom will you give statin in patient with hypertension? Yeah. Whom will you give statins? So there is a lot of hype about the statins these days and there has been two groups of patients where we should use statins. First, the primary prevention where patient already has an atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease like the stroke, peripheral vascular disease or a uh, cardiac event, then the levels have to be even brought below uh, 70 milligram percent of LDL cholesterol, which is the bad cholesterol in the common notion. If the patient does not have a cardiovascular event earlier, then the secondary prevention uh, is only associated if the patient has associated risk factors like diabetes and we calculate the risk factor. Now the guidelines are if the patients are between 40 to 75 years of age with diabetes and hypertension, whatever is the level they should be put on statins and the statins dose adjusted is every 4 to 12 weeks given a higher dose initially and the levels are tested again and then you can put patient on a lower dose or a maintenance dose which he can continue and see the risk. Thank you very much. On this note, I think we will conclude here giving you the message that heart attack and hypertension or increased blood pressure is a very preventable disease by good lifestyle modification, healthy lifestyle modification. And of course, when you need drugs, you also require that. So I would advise that you shun the six S's. There are six S's which are very important. Salt, sugar, and saturated fat. These are the three in the diet. And then stress, sedentary lifestyle, and smoking. If you shun these six S's, most of the problems are solved. Thank you very much.